I'm a huge fan of Miles Kebeke. He started the restaurant Voyeurs after starring in an advert about a fictional restaurant called Voyeurs, which he then made into a real restaurant. He's now the co-founder of Wakanda, a food entrepreneur organization, and there are very few people in the country right now better placed to talk about the plight of restaurateurs and the food industry than Miles. Today we're going to ask him about some of the problems that um, food entrepreneurs are, are facing and, um, and how he intends to get involved in the solution. Let's connect. There we go. That's better. This is the best I can do. Is this still busy? Uh, yeah, I just need to get the top of your head. That's cool. Perfect. Yeah. This is fine. Done. Nice. Nice. Okay, cool. All yeah. right, cool. You're a good looking guy, Bri, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think the chick behind you is a better, better, better than your pictures. <laughs> Miles, so good yeah. to to have you on uh, the Heavy Chef channel. Um, it's uh, We are huge fans of yours and the Heavy Chef crew have uh, watched your career trajectory since seeing you in those Nedbank ads, the, the cocky youngster, <laughs> and, uh, and then <laughs> jumping on an opportunity and pivoting something that really was just, I think, uh, you know, an idea and, and making it real. And, uh, and that was quite phenomenal. Yeah. So well done on that, my man. Thank you, thank you. And I'm actually equally, uh, I must say, uh, uh, a, a fan. I've been, I've been watching the stuff you're doing in the entrepreneurial space. And, you know, it's such a tough ecosystem that the more strong people we have in it and building on it, um, that's the only way we're going to turn this country's economy and, and take it forward. I, I sincerely believe that. Thank you. So I appreciate that. And I think... You know, looking at, at this community that we have and entrepreneurs, you know, within our sector, Lord mm. knows right now in the days of COVID-19 and Zoom meetings and so on, we need all of our entrepreneurs to step up. And I think just looking at where we're at now, I want to dive straight into the, the sector that you're in. I'm in the restaurant trade at the moment is in complete upheaval. And we speak to shop owners, restaurant owners, people in hospitality every single day. And everybody is hemorrhaging. You know, it's, it's just blood in the right. streets. And, and this is your sector. This is your tribe. Um, Miles, yeah. I keep wanting to call you Voyo. I'm pretty sure you get that a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do. Can you give us a little bit of a, um, an indication? First of all, what you had to before uh the the, the yeah. crisis hit and then you know how, how it looks for you now i obviously um you know brand restaurant fuyos and um i subsequently um essentially i guess pivoted unintentionally so but i i, I realized while i was growing the business that there's something fundamentally wrong with the food ecosystem um uh, and i was privileged in that i, I had the visibility of the entire ecosystem uh, often when you're in a food ecosystem, you've just got visibility to the track or the lane you are in. And by just circumstance, and largely because I didn't actually come from the food ecosystem initially. I come, I'm a systems engineer. So when I left Microsoft and I started a restaurant, there were a lot of things that I was finding that didn't make sense. Um, and then obviously my story also got me into very interesting places. I had a TV show where I just went to all the top restaurants and I ate. Uh, and then I, and then I did things like, uh, I had Best another show where ever. we uh, essentially went to farms. Yeah. I was an eaters there for a while. And then I went to, um, see how, um, like for example, feedlots work. Uh, something you, no one would ever have visibility. So we shot and we did a lot of stuff in a different veterinarian show, just looking at how farmers are growing animals. And then I did same thing with uh, fruit and vegetables. So I had an amazing exposure to the entire ecosystem. Then we went to manufacturing and retail. Essentially, what we do at Wakanda is we find all the amazing food creators across all the food verticals. So from farmers to um, guys who are making consumer packaged goods to restauranteurs, and we put them in a, 
um, essentially Wakanda is an accelerator. It's a space where we have shared kitchen, for example, which was something I would have wanted when I was studying my, uh, my restaurant business, a place where I could go in R&D and test new recipes and stuff. Um, because the barriers to entry in the restaurant business are prohibitive. Um, the equipment is, is very expensive. So you've got amazing chefs uh, or home cooks that are doing amazing things at home, but they can't go into the ecosystem because um, kitchen equipment is too expensive. The health and safety requirements are prohibitive. So I said, what if we could build a space where all these food creatives could come into one place and have access to all the kit they need to be creative? And then back that up with all the backend support that we would need to make it into a sustainable business. So whether it's accounting, marketing, operations, and all that stuff. And that's what essentially we do at Wakanda. Um, wow, hoping that amazing. makes sense. So it makes total yeah. sense. And I, and I love the idea. I um, also love the, the, uh, the job description of being an eatist. <laughs> I want to fly. <laughs> So um, <laughs> you're more than welcome. Um, I mean, I can't yeah. help but ask then the question: How how has it been uh, disrupted? Yeah, and that's the 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 beautiful part about this. It was that um, you know when you put a bunch of amazing food creatives, initially, obviously, you're supporting them in growing and scaling their businesses. So that goes without saying. But then you realize very quickly that you've got an amazing bunch of people, talented individuals under one space. So, you know, um, what we can do together is worth more than the sum of its parts. You know, in other words, the brain pool that sits there can start solving for really big problems. And that's what we actually started doing. And because we've got guys who are working in nutrition, guys who are working in food access, guys working on climate change, guys working on food waste. All of a sudden you have all these people doing amazing things in one space. Um, then we start saying, well, how about we solve actually the really fundamentally big problems? So one, when COVID hit, we already, and I'll touch base later on what we were already doing, um, but it was very easy for us to be part of the solution when COVID-19 hit because we were already thinking about some of the uh, things that weren't working in the food ecosystem. So essentially, even before COVID-19, we knew that uh, the food ecosystem had really big challenges and it wasn't really gonna be sustainable going forward if you factor in climate change and other, uh, other variables. Um, so we're already working on some of that. But now with COVID-19, all of a sudden, as you, can, as you obviously know, a lot of restaurants have had to close down for this 21-day period. Um, that has a huge impact, not only uh, on the restaurants, but the staff that work in, that, in those restaurants. Uh, and, and then the multiplier impact in terms of how many people those people feed and, and so forth. And a lot of staff in, in, uh, in hospitality or particularly in restaurants earn tips. So they no work, no pay, essentially. Um, and there's things like, uh, for example, that we were already working on is that there's no way of, or there isn't currently in, especially in the restaurant space, uh, recognition of people's um, um, experience. So if you're a waiter, you're a waiter. There's no senior waiter. There's no um, there's no way of vetting. There's no way of appreciating long service. It's fundamentally, I mean, imagine you working in a profession and there's no recognition. Regardless, you've worked 20 years or 15 years, you're the same. And there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And that needs to be fixed. Yeah? And those are the things that I think COVID-19 gives us as an opportunity to fix. So we see it as a, both a gift and a curse. Uh, because obviously it's not ideal, but at the same time, we see it as a great opportunity to fix or fast track the things that were already fundamentally broken. And Miles, I mean, that is such a fascinating topic because obviously these are issues that you've been thinking about for some time and everybody's banding around this term, you know, never waste a good crisis. And I think, yeah. look, as much as it's, over, it's overused, I do believe that there is some truth to it because what this is, essentially doing is galvanizing and catalyzing a fundamental shift across the board in so many different categories. And can you yeah. maybe speak to that and speak to what you are currently implementing, um, you know, within, uh, particularly with, uh, with reference to the restaurant owners and their teams, 
uh, and how they can respond to this crisis. So one of the reasons how I tripped and fell into um, running and having amazing time in an accelerator was I got a call about, um, it's about two years ago now, 18 months ago, from a principal from a local school close to where my restaurant uh, is in Soweto on Vilagazi Street. And this principal called me up and said, listen, she needs to speak to me. Now, I didn't like seeing uh, the headmistress when I was at school, so I wasn't very keen to see one now. So <laughs> I won't lie. I took about, uh, I, I think I took two weeks to make it there. And I eventually <laughs> dragged myself there. And she set me down. She says, Miles, my son, I'm principal, guys. I've um, taken over the school about uh, eight or nine months ago. And um, when I took over the school, the pass rate was, um, uh, I think it was it was 75% pass rate for metric. And she said to me, she's going to get that pass rate to uh, 100% by the end of that year. I said, okay, cool. She says, and how she's doing that, she's getting all the grade uh, 10s and, uh, sorry, grade 11s and 12s to come for extra lessons every Saturday. And it's been working, it's, it was March time around then, but the problem was that um, the school feeding scheme only works um, Monday to Friday. So she's been paying out of her own pocket so to feed the kids for lunch uh, during those Saturdays. And um, it was becoming prohibitive for her. So I asked her, so how much are you, you know, how much is this all costing? She says, well, it's 300 bucks. I'm like, you said it's 145 kids. Uh, like, what are you feeding them? You know, this is 300 rands a kid. She says, no, 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 it's 300 rands for all of them. That's less than 200 rand. I mean, so that's less than two rands a child. And now I've subsequently trained as a chef and I know for a fact you can't uh, feed anybody a nutritious meal for sub two rands. It's just impossible. So I ask her what she's feeding them. She says, pup and cabbage. Now, pup has got zero nutritional value and cabbage, even when it's fortified and cabbage, you know, it's just, you know, it's just combustible, man. <laughs> you put 45 kids with cabbage and, and pup, that's a recipe for disaster, bro. So, so it's like two bucks. And now I've grown up in the township. So I've lived there, I grew up there, my business was there. And how was this happening on my watch? How is the school just up the road having such challenges? And it turned out that every weekend we would see more than um, 145 kids. It was on average two, uh, 200 kids because what the kids would do, um, if I have a brother at home, I would give him my um, school uniform to come to school with me so he can eat because that's the only meal that both of us are gonna see until Monday. So, but like, you know, I sit there with my mouth wide shut. Like, how how is this even a challenge in 2018 it was? And then um, I called some of our partners and suppliers. Long story short, we started feeding the school. Long story short, we had a 90% pass rate. So, great, wow. I think. You know, did by part, great. Like, okay, good, moving on. Except in Jan, I get a call. Now these kids made it to varsity. Guess what? At varsity, they get a NESFAS fund, so they get their money, they spend it uh, on airtime. The first time they see girls, what do you think they're gonna do? Uh, they do all the stuff here and I did at varsity. I mean, part of varsity is about self-discovery and making stupid decisions. That's what it is, particularly first year. Um, and except varsities weren't built for or you got a fully comprehensive uh, um, bursary, which means you um, you eat at the dining hall. But when you've got Nesfas, Nesfas gives you the money. So all of a sudden, you don't fit in the normal stream of university. And guess what these kids were doing with their money? Other than the stupid decisions here and there, most of their money was going back home. They were sending the money home. Right, and then when we started giving them food parcels, guess what they do every quarter with those food parcels? They send it home. So all of a sudden, you start seeing how big these problems are, and no one is solving for them because a, no one really knows about them. But secondly, 
solving for big problems requires systems thinking. You require people who are working on nutrition. You require people who are working on food access. We require people who are working on food waste. Um, and you require all of them to work towards a common purpose. Yeah. So these are where the things we were starting to do already so before this um, uh, event happened. And so what we've now done is we just galvanized the same mind pool to say, okay, now it's immediate. What can we do right now to deal with these fundamentally big problems like social distancing when we know for a fact that it's impossible to socially distance people when they're living in a one room shack? Good luck with that, right? So what do we do? Or more importantly, what do you do when now everybody is sent home on lockdown. So we've got 13 million kids in the education system, um, 9 million of which live, uh, require those, um, the feeding scheme that I was talking to you about earlier. So now 9 million of them are at home and their mothers are waiters and stuff. They have no money to buy bread. How do we feed those people now? Right? Um, so those are, or, or worse, there's toilet paper that's sitting in all the corporate office parks, but now the toilet paper is sitting at the offices and the people are at home. How do we get that toilet paper into communities that need it? So that's kind of the context of what we are essentially solving for. That's hugely valuable. And I think it's, these are such amazing points and insights that I don't think most of us would have thought of. The fact that, you know, essentially what you're doing is analyzing the scenario and connecting the dots. And there, there's some pretty yeah. obvious dots to be connected, right? But sometimes those right. are the, the, you know, the easiest ones to miss. So we've launched a, a very, very cool, and, I, uh, and I, I implore people to go join us. Um, we've, we've launched a hackathon um, uh, with uh, 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 two of our other partners, uh, Oribi Village, as well as Food Lab. Um, and what we essentially done, we put a call to action to amazing people and brains out there to say, listen, um, in the food ecosystem, as we agree, has a number of challenges. It's essentially broken. Um, but let's try and fix it under the context of COVID-19 because it does give us a catalyst to do stuff that we can see results now. And we have to do it because if a major part of our population is not catered for, this is you and I's problem when the, the 21 days moves from 21 to 91. We're doing it under the 21 days. We're looking for some smart ideas in terms of what people are seeing and what they can uh, contribute into solving the, uh, specific problems under six categories. So I'm sure if we can, we can send out the link and people can uh, we'll essentially- We'll certainly join. add it to the show notes without a doubt. I, I'll, um, and I'll share it with our community as well. I'm pretty sure there's a ah, few would people appreciate who would that. be very interested in getting involved. You're obviously on the front line now. You're, you're dealing with a lot of the problems firsthand and you're speaking with a lot of restaurateurs and and food entrepreneurs. I mean, can you maybe talk to some of the, the you know, the, the solutions that you're seeing and, and what advice do you have for, um, for restaurateurs and, and food entrepreneurs that are out there really kind of struggling, sitting at home going, how am I going to save, you know, not just my, my business, but my entire category and my, my career that I'm so passionate about? What can I do going forward? Uh, I, I do understand government's concern. I think restaurants should be closed, that goes without saying, because, you know, the uh, people congregating into small spaces is not ideal. The only way to flatten this curve is by uh, social distancing. So that's, that's not in dispute. But we have kitchens in restaurants that could be cooking and either serving other essential services people, all the cops, all the soldiers, all the nurses and doctors need food right we could be servicing those guys right now right and chefs and restaurants um if you really look at it we're all trained in health and safety so we're probably better equipped to manage um uh viruses uh, because we we are forced to the, you know there's regulations on how you prep and serve food so we like honestly most qualified to be seen as an essential service right so close the restaurants but we could have kept the kitchens open. We could be cooking. Because I know we've got lots of restaurateurs right now sitting with stock, sitting in freezers, right? We could, I know farmers who could be, who 
could be supplying those restaurants for processing the food and, and ultimately getting it out into either essential services or into the communities that need food, right? So, um, and one of the other things the entrepreneurs that are uh, in our ecosystem are telling me is that, dude, we don't want bailouts. Who said we want bailouts? Firstly, no one ever came to us and, uh, and asked us what we need as entrepreneurs. Everybody is creating all these big funds and uh, assumes we, we need bailouts. And secondly, the other thing I heard today, most of them are pissed off because when they start applying for the Oppenheimer this or that one, it's actually not, it's not a bailout. It's actually a loan. It's a 60 month loan, um, repayable. And they're like, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> one, one surefire way to piss off a restaurateur. <laughs> Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, if they need another so, loan, another loan, right? Yeah. So how does that make sense? I mean, so the the core solutions, because I'm, we are all, always solutions driven. They're saying, instead of giving us bailouts, we want to, we want offtakes. We want to be part of the solution. Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 the prevailing mentality of people is that they believe that the restaurateurs are completely helpless, right? And that they they don't know um, yes. they they don't know how to help themselves. And I think that's that's the the I think that's the opinion that people have at the moment, or at least the mindset. So it's like, oh, we just want to give people money. And and I think what you're suggesting is radically different, right? It's a far more practical, sustainable solution. Yeah, so especially startups on the ground are saying to me, look, dude, we, we don't want bailouts, all right? No one actually asked us what we want. They just assumed we, we want bailouts, but th that's not the truth. Um, and they're saying to me, what we actually want is to be part of the solution. Um, we've got events planners, right, that can deploy thousands of toilets. We can set up marquees tomorrow and feed people and be part of the solution and pay us for that. Pay us for services rendered rather than um, after the fact, send us money. Meanwhile, we could, be, we could have been working and help to address the problem. Um, restaurants are sitting with food in, in, in their walk-in closets. I mean, sorry, no walk-in freezers. <laughs> and, um, and it's frozen. It's sitting there. That food we could be cooking and sending it out to either feed other communities or other essential services people. But the point is, guys are keen right now to be part of the solution as opposed to be waiting for a bailout and therefore becoming part of the actual problem. We'll be sending this out in the newsletter to our community and, uh, and Miles, we'll, we'll, chat, we'll chat with you again real soon. Take care of yourself, my man. You too, man. Keep safe, eh? Cheers, dude. Take care. Sure, Bye -bye. man. Sure. But yeah, let's crack on with this, this interview, um, although I can't see you. Yeah, just one more second. I'm just testing oh, okay. on my ear pods because okay. I've got a background oh, noise. Let me do that as well. That's a good call, dude. Let me get my... Because yeah, oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. So a huge um, difference uh, to the recording as well. Okay, cool. Oh. Let's quickly get my uh, ear pods connect. There we go. That's perfect. This is the best I can do. So sure. can I interrupt you just a second? I, I, the the connection totally went off after you said off takes. Um, yes. And I've just realized that my my kid is outside here making a, a heck of a racket. Just one second. No problem. Guys, um, just okay. Thank you. This is the new reality. <laughs> <laughs>